Hello, global gardeners. It's Monday. It's gardening time. Let's get our gardening week started as we move forward with just all the information you were hoping you could find on a Monday and other gardeners to talk to. I think that's one of the biggest things we like about these Monday live streams. I often talk about the lessons that you can learn from your garden. Well, today we're actually going to focus on some of the things you can teach and learn in your garden. So a little bit of a twist to that, the many lessons that we can teach ourselves and other members of our family and our friends in the garden. Let's go ahead and start with a question from KT. End of season, my bush bean plants developed a fungus, didn't treat. How do I mend the soil now for next year? So could be anthracnose. That's a common problem in very wet conditions for beans in particular. And the, the main solution is to try to have well-draining soil. And if you're in a very wet region, try to have the plants far enough apart so there's lots of air circulation. You might actually want to reduce the mulch so that the soil can dry out between waterings or if you have a lot of rain. It's, it's nothing that you can actually actively treat, but think about the soil. And, and so your question is a good one. Amend your soil like you normally would, put all that organic matter into the soil, but look more at the cultural practices that you use in the garden. Do you overwater or are you in an area that gets a lot of rain? Because it's those really wet conditions that can lead to the fungal problems that we have in our garden. And so if it's always wet, removing the mulch could be an issue. But mulch can also be a great way to moderate the the moisture levels within the soil so that you don't need to water as often so whenever you have these kind of issues fungal issues the kind of of problems that are indicative of too much water get in there and actually physically check your soil more often and you may find that you're overwatering. And so with that organic matter in the soil, with or without mulch, you might be able to get to the point where you're not watering as often. The soil stays moist and not wet, and that can help reduce some of those fungal issues. So I uh, hope that gives you a couple ideas, but look, at, look up the anthracnose uh, disease in bush beans, and you might also see some other cultural recommendations. Um, oh, there you go. Laurifil says anthracnose goes after strawberry. Yeah, anthracnose um, can actually affect a lot of plants, and it's it's the wet conditions that it absolutely thrives in. Um, so James is asking, what do I think of the new product on the market, Ease or EZ? Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, and I'm not sure that I'm aware of that, so can't comment on that, but... I just made myself a note to look into it. And uh, if I find out something and have a great comment for you as to what I think, uh, maybe I'll talk about that next week in particular. So nice to see so many people checking in, Bohemian Herbology checking in from the Midwest. Jay and Heidi, of course, are here, our wonderful moderators. It's so nice to see everybody. Yeah, KT says, too much rain and maybe overwatered and planted too close. There you go. All conditions that can lead to anthracnose. Straw can actually help. Uh, at, as mulches go, the straw can dry out a little bit faster. So that might be a better option than some of the other mulches that are dense and actually hold in moisture a little bit more. Good morning to Bettina in eastern Ontario and Vanessa in Tennessee. It's nice to have so many people checking in. And I, I, I saw someone briefly, I missed the name, checking in Iowa as well. So as always, we've got people from all over. So today I, I got to thinking about some of the things that we used to do at the Galileo School Garden when we'd have the students out. And, and often there was a disconnect between what the teachers were teaching or 
thought that they could be teaching in the garden and what I think were the opportunities for what could be taught in the garden. <clears throat> so today I'm looking at it from a teacher perspective and a student perspective of of just how beneficial the garden can be now if you do homeschooling or you know someone that does homeschooling some of these ideas hopefully can really help you out if you've got kids or grandkids and you like to share lessons this could be a great opportunity or if you're just like many of us and we're looking for ways to learn new things the garden is a is a great opportunity let's start with math for instance arithmetic there are many, many people. As school subjects go, math is the one that most people say they just don't get or they don't like or they're not good at. But if you think about it, even if you consider yourself not good at math, the garden is one of those opportunities to get better at math. In fact, you may be good at math when it comes to gardening and you don't think you're good at math in everyday life. One of the things that, that I did at the Galileo Garden with a math class in particular that came out one day, had the kids standing around the raised beds and I talked about how I plan the garden and how we put plants and seeds in. And I demonstrated and I had a tape measure and I gave all the kids yardsticks. We actually measured the beds and the width of the beds are four feet and the length of the beds are eight feet and I demonstrated to them how simple it was. Four times eight is 32. The surface of the bed is 32 square feet. And then as we started talking about seeds and plants, I just showed how easy it was to set up that grid of 32 square foot sections. And that's how we could decide where seeds and plants went in. Now, many of you are aware of the square foot gardening book and that method of gardening. And I just demonstrated that to the kids and allowed them to actually measure the beds themselves. And then it was very simple to add the concept of volume. So we measured the height of the beds and that bed in particular was two feet high. So now we had 32 square feet times the two foot height, which meant the volume of that bed was 64 cubic feet. So when it came time to fill the bed with soil, I knew how much soil I needed to put in. So that was a lesson that lasted, just like I said to you, a couple minutes. The teacher came to me later and said she'd been trying to, to teach square feet and cubic feet to her students for more than a week. And some of the, the kids just didn't get it they couldn't understand it but those 10 minutes in the garden demonstrating how it works turned the light bulb on for the entire class and she said that one visit to the garden was worth days of teaching in a classroom so of course that turned the light bulb on with me and we tried to expand all the lessons that we could teach in the garden and so take a minute and of course math is the most obvious thing that you can think of but what else can you teach or what can you teach yourself or what can you learn from others in the garden have you ever thought about literature i used to love to have the english classes come out to the garden and read books in the garden now first off just being in that outdoor setting I got feedback from some of the teachers that the students actually learned and absorbed more from their books just being outside and reading in that space. But you can also find many literature classics that are set in gardens or at some point in the book there is a walk through a garden or a discussion of a garden. One of the most famous and and a classical book that, that you could actually tie into a garden setting is The Secret Garden. Imagine having your kids read The Secret Garden when they're sitting in your garden. How great is that? So that's the basic concept, is using your garden as a classroom, as a way to teach 
whoever it is that you want to teach to include yourself. And those are some of the things I'll be talking about. And there's a lot more that we'll be discussing in the time ahead. Shandy's Garden says art too. Absolutely. I used to love having the art students come out and sketch and and what they would what I, I worked with the art teacher actually bring the students out to the garden so the students would come out and sketch in the garden and then they would go back to the classroom and where they had all the supplies and that's where they would do watercolors and and paintings but i would also during the beginning of the school year harvest all kinds of different things from squashes and pumpkins to tomatoes and cucumbers and would give all of that to the art teacher to create a still life. And so for a few weeks every year, the table in the middle of the art room was filled with what we had harvested from the garden and the students did their, their sketches and their paintings with real live harvested material well, not technically live but harvested materials from our garden to include the the corn the dried corn stalks and whatever we could find we just varied it and gave the students a lesson so you're absolutely right art is a great thing that you can you can do in the garden i when says my high school biology class was was built in or built a garden uh, absolutely. And, and that's one of the things on my list. The biology, I talk so much about the soil life and, and how important it is. And then, of course, bringing in the birds and the insects, the beneficial insects, and how they interact with the harmful insects. That's biology. That's nature in action. And it's a great opportunity to just observe nature and tie that in to biology and, and the concept of biology. But you can take it much further than that. Dr. Elaine Ingham, the, the, the promoter of the soil food web, is a big proponent of using microscopes and actually taking your soil, putting it underneath a microscope and looking at the life within the soil. And the, the, the to dozens and hundreds and potentially thousands of species that you can see in your soil through a microscope, it, it, it brings it down to what is happening right there at the fingertips of the student. You can read a book, you can see the pictures in a book of the nematodes and the fungal threads and all those other things that you could see in a microscope. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great seeing it in a book. But when you can actually scoop out some soil and then put it under your own microscope and then see that life, that's an unforgettable, unforgettable moment. And it really makes biology real for students. So uh, I'm glad you were able to experience that in high school because that's definitely one of those things that can benefit uh, all of us it's and, and and the reason dr ingham talks about using a microscope is because most of us including myself improve our soil we add the organics we we can reach a point where we know our soil is alive and we're happy with that but when you can actually see the soil live you can learn to modify your soil by changing the amendments, by changing what you do to your soil, you can modify it. You can increase the bacteria, you can increase the fungi, you can increase the nematodes, you can actually change the biology of your soil once you know what is in your soil and then take the steps to, to change the food, change the moisture, change the, the mineral components, there's lots of ways you can actually modify your soil. That's, that's one of those things we can teach ourselves. I'm planning on getting a microscope at one of these points. I'm looking at some microscopes that have the camera attachment so I can actually make some videos on, on some of this. But not only for myself, because I want to learn more about the biology within the garden, but as lessons for my grandkids, of course. And what a great opportunity for a kid to scoop up some soil 
and take a look at what's alive in it. I just, I think that's incredible. Dan says, I calculated how much soil I need for my bed, wound up with a huge mound extra, didn't account for density and compacting. Yep. Plus soil mix had too much topsoil and not enough nutrient rich compost. Yeah. And so there's a whole nother level when you, when you're looking at the math of, of soil, the, the organic component that we mix in the soil. And so generally when I fill my beds and when I'm amending my beds, initially I'm looking for about a 25% organic component. When I get that initial boost of organics in filling a bed. Of course, most of that organic material is going to decompose. So as you fill your bed, with a mix of native soil and the organics, that's one part of the math. Then if you actually measure, and, and I've done this recently, that in my first year, some of those beds actually dropped five inches as all of that organic matter began to decompose. Now, as you amend your beds each year, preferably for me in the fall, I know how much organic matter how much compost I need to add to that bed because I've done the math to figure out how much it's compacted, how much of that organic matter has been fully decomposed, and so how much I need to now add to the bed to bring the level back up to where I want it to be the next spring to start putting the plants in. So uh, good point, Dan. The, the initial calculation is just one part of it. And it's really a good idea to actually keep going with those calculations as you uh, maintain your garden year after year. Jerry says, I was in public education for 33 years. The lessons that can take place in the garden are only limited by a teacher's imagination and creativity. I completely agree. And sadly, a lot of the teachers don't have that imagination. I think I mentioned a few weeks ago, which is why I wanted to to do this show today that I had a math teacher who came out to the garden and made that comment. I just don't see how we could teach math in the garden. She didn't have that imagination. She didn't have that creativity. Once I gave her some of these very specific lessons like the, the square foot and the cubic foot exercise, it, it became obvious but we really do need to hope for some of that imagination and creativity. Sadly, it's not there as, as much as we would like to see. Gardens Happen said, I even had a climate scientist give me some resources for that video I need to read through. And, and, and so climate and weather, great things to teach in the garden. Of course, we know how the weather impacts our plants. And so why not learn more about weather? I've got some videos on the impact of weather and what you can do to protect your garden. I, I don't have a lot yet. And actually, I'm, I'm hoping to try to figure out a way to do some videos to teach how to interpret the forecasts and the weather patterns. Because I use that a lot. I talk a lot in my videos uh, and in the live streams about looking at the forecast as you're putting your seeds in, as you're harvesting, as you're doing all the different things. But understanding how those patterns actually work. As a, most of you know that I was a, a career pilot in the United States Air Force. Weather was a critical factor when you fly an airplane. Well, I've used so much that I learned flying airplanes and looking at the clouds and understanding how the weather impacts the sky that I now try to bring that literally down to earth so that I can see how those weather patterns impact my garden and the plants I choose and whether I need protection or not. All a great series of lessons. If you have someone that can teach you those lessons and then pass them on, more power to you. The biggest issue is Weather is just not one of those things that's typically taught in school, and most of us don't have a teacher for that, partic that particular subject, but it is something I would encourage that you learn. Paul's got a really good point. Got a good lesson in carpentry, <coughs> building the beds. 
I, I have a, a lot of very basic videos. The, the video, video I have on how to build a raised bed, I, I've gotten a few comments over the years. I think it's about a two-year-old, actually almost a three-year-old video now. And, you know, initially got some comments saying, oh, this is too simple. You know, you, you talk to us like we're kindergartners. I think I got one of those comments. I got another comment with someone saying I should have used better screws that had a different type of head to it because it'll hold better. That's fine. Those people are carpenters or know what they're doing. But I've had hundreds of comments from people saying, I didn't know how to do this. Thank you for showing me how to build a bed because Paul is right. Many of us don't have those basic building or carpentry skills and the garden is an ideal place to learn how to do some of that and have hands-on practical experience building your raised beds. And, and I continue to do that, whether it be the concrete block beds or the metal beds, I, I do that so that I can learn how to do new and different things in my garden. So absolutely great point that you are uh, raising there that that uh, it's not just the math and the literature and the biology kind of lessons it can be a lot of the practical carpentry kind of lessons and and I've, I've, i have other videos like building the fountains you know some of those things how to how to take a pump and put it into a pot and create a pump a a a pumping of the water through rocks or plants or whatever it happens to be and now you've built a fountain to your garden there's just so many things we can teach and learn that i think every day is a learning experience in the garden in one way or another tj the hawk says i've learned about a lot about patience and perseverance absolutely that's one of the, my top five things that you need to have to garden is the patience but definitely the perseverance i completely agree with that shandy's garden says so many ways to build something raised even if it's a swimming pool with the bottom cut out or some kind of a crate or cinder corners with wood and no screws at all yeah and, and actually i'm planning on building one of those beds with the cinder blocks with uh, uh, the slots cut into them so you can make a bed so I'll, i wanted to do that this year i'll probably do that next year but you're absolutely right uh, th th there are so many things you can learn and teach that that don't even require tools. And I think the garden is just an absolutely fantastic way to do it. Hi, Gail. Learned how to build my beds from my videos. Awesome. That is a great way to, to, to learn. And that's definitely one of the reasons why I, I did that. So I think it's awesome as well. Uh, how about writing? If you have a diary or if you have a journal have you written in it in the garden that was another thing we used to do with the english classes was just bring them into the garden for their writing lessons and and the creativity that the students had in their writing lessons in the garden was better than <laughs> the creativity that they had just sitting at a desk in a classroom. And so you can really enrich your mind and, and allow your imagination to just expand beyond what you might normally expect by being outside in a garden. There's just, there's just that energy in the garden that releases a lot of that creativity. And and, and even the simple act of writing. The, one of the, the things, I think it was for the sixth graders we had at the school, one of the primary lessons that the English teachers were teaching was, was paragraph and composition. The idea of having a, a, a sentence to start the paragraph and then the paragraph needed to be at least three sentences long and then that last sentence needed to tie up the paragraph, that basic concept. And so for a lot of students, at that school at least, that exercise was difficult. Just the concept of how to put a paragraph together that consisted of multiple sentences. In the classroom, it was a struggle for many students. 
incredibly, and, and, and I really have no explanation for this, those same students in the garden, when they were asked to write paragraphs about what they saw in the garden, it worked. A paragraph in a classroom, they would struggle with the structure. But in the garden where they could look at a plant and then write three or four or five sentences about what they're seeing and put it in the form of a paragraph, it worked. They figured it out and they were able to, to understand simple grammatical structure by just being in the garden and having an opportunity to write. And so how many of us even think about that? We, we're in bed, we're in our chair, we're at our morning table when we're writing in our journal. Just move it outside and I bet you'll see an increase in your creativity, maybe in how much you write and it's easy. It's, it's, it's one of those things that I encourage you have those sitting areas in your garden. I'll have a sitting area with a table that you can put your, your book, your journal, your pad of paper on. And that could be a great way to expand your own writing abilities because you're probably going to do it more often or at least be more creative in what you do outside. Because it really can be fun and it, it really does just open up the mind when you do some of these things. So Jean-Pierre says, I learned to speak much better English by seeing your videos. Yeah, thank you, Jean-Pierre. I appreciate that. And, and yes, I've had uh, many people from around the world comment on that. That's one reason why I continue to talk in all of my videos and on these live streams and as consistent a voice as possible. And I really try to enunciate and stress the individual word, word words because I recognize that literally the global audience that watches the Gardener's God videos. And, and you're not alone, Jean-Pierre. There are many others from around the world that have used my videos to, to, to learn English. So uh, yet another example that actually wasn't on my list today, but, but learning to speak another language particularly when it comes to something you have that interest in, that passion, that gardening desire, and watching the gardening videos in other languages uh, could be a great opportunity to help learn that language. And so for some of us with English as our primary language, we don't often think about it. But for the others trying to learn English, that's what they're doing. So why not learn another language? There are some great channels out there in other languages. And if you have an interest in that language, you might seek out some of those gardening videos and uh, it could definitely help out. Uh, I, I haven't done that. Uh, I haven't really tried to learn a language in a while, but a few years ago when uh, we were planning to do a trip to Italy and I was trying to learn some more English, I actually took Italian a couple of years in high school, years and years ago. So I was trying to rekindle my knowledge of Italian and and I did that in a, in a couple videos of garden tours in Italy and picked up on some of what the signs were saying and what some of the words were. It works. It really does. It's one of those things that, that can really benefit you and never even think about it. Learn another language through gardening. Okay, let's see what we have. I'm going to scroll and, and uh, Shandy's garden. Yeah, to garden is to believe in tomorrow and preparing to be more sustainable helps with finance. Good. That's a real good point. Um, learning about finance, learning about money. It kind of ties in with math, but it's at whole next level. And I was having this conversation with my son the other day, just how they don't teach these things like finance in school anymore. And so, yeah, as especially if, if you're on a budget and you're trying to garden on a budget, look at how much you've learned when it comes to how many seeds you can buy, what kind of tools you are able to purchase, all of those things that tie into our budget and how much money we're going to be spending in the garden. There's a lesson there. There's a lot of lessons there, even if you're not completely aware of it. 
And so if you're learning how to budget your garden, why not teach that to someone else? Someone who might not understand those lessons as well. I think that's uh, a, a great opportunity that maybe we don't often uh, take as as much time to to do. And and John is exactly right. I learned to listen to my grandparents' instruction, and so I talk you know regularly about teaching my granddaughters in the garden, and I remember my my aunt and my grandmother in particular and listening to them as they talked in their garden so this is one of those things that yeah it's it's easy to learn but maybe if we're teaching it's better to teach and have the lesson be listened to in the garden they're just they're, the garden is just a, a space where we can focus our attention on whatever it is we want to focus on and so if we're focused on a person talking it does tend to be more of a focus because of of the space it just allows us to focus to to change our focus from one thing to another to include the people that we're listening to so i think that's absolutely fantastic there's chris the grapes took off chris was talking about grapes i don't know was that about a month ago we were talking about the grapes so thanks for that update yeah i i had i put in a couple uh, seedless Concord grape plants this year and you know like Chris in the beginning I was very concerned nothing was happening and now my grapes are doing well too so let's keep our fingers crossed Chris lives in a much warmer area than I do but let's keep our fingers crossed that all of our <laughs> grapes are gonna do great this year Laura Full says my grandma always told us not to dig holes in the yard and I never understood why until at her funeral <laughs> that's funny you have a great sense of humor. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Ultimate Gardening says, Hi, Gardener Scott. I finally started my first batch of veggie seedlings. Awesome. That's fantastic. It's one of those things, and, and I'll talk about that at the end of the show today. Some of these, these things and our progression and the new things we try and the successes that we have and how happy we are to see so many of the things that, that we have Bowtie Life, nice to see you here, and um, you're on my list. I keep talking about it, it's coming. I've talked about it in recent weeks, but there's some small channels with some videos out there that I want to highlight. Bowtie Life has some videos that show what's happening in the garden, and uh, nice to see you here. Long time watcher, first time on live. Great to be here. Love all your wealth of information. I've learned so much. Awesome. So glad that... That I and of course one of the nice things about being here on the live is everybody else there's so much great gardening knowledge that we share back and forth and so so often when I go back in and, and review these videos after their live because I missed so much of what's happening in the comments such great information questions being asked and answered stories being shared by all of you while I'm talking about whatever the subject happens to be. So Bowtie, Bowtie Life, I'm glad you're here today and definitely take advantage of everybody else that's out there to help share some of the information. The Unlocked Farmer, thank you very much for that super chat. Learn my lesson this season. Don't get greedy and plant eight squash and two pumpkins in a 15 by 15 space cramped and now I have to spray hundreds of leaves <clears throat> so yeah absolutely this actually ties into the math lesson when you when you think about or actually look into how big the plant is going to get you got to figure out if it's going to fit in a space and so pumpkins in particular depending on the type of pumpkin two pumpkins uh, in a 15 by 15 foot space, especially if you're growing the, the, the big carving or even the giant pumpkins, they'll take up that whole space all by themselves. And then you throw in all the squash plants. Uh, so that is a, a good lesson to learn. And so next year, we take that 15 by 15 space and figure out, try to how many, or try to figure out how many plants of whatever type squashes again or something different will fit best <clears throat> that you know that that's the concept behind the square foot gardening that i talked about earlier is figuring out how to put the maximum number of plants in a bed 
and it's all math. It's, it's just mathematical analysis and figuring it out. Too often, what we do, like the Unlocked Farmer, is put the plants in and then after the fact, figure out that you get greedy and you put too many in. And that's how most of us experience gardening is, well, I put in the eight plants last year and it was too much. This year I'll put in six plants and the six plants are still too much. And then you find out that four plants are the happy point to fill a particular space. Well, you, you can actually figure that out ahead of time mathematically and and save yourself a couple years of of trying that's that's one of those things about the lessons that can be taught in a garden i like you like to see how much i can pack in and and i'm a little guilty of that myself this year i've, I've got um the the squash plants as well that are growing in beds i put in three zucchini plants now, I've got the cattle panel trellises that allow me to grow them vertically so that I can fit the three zucchini plants in that bed, but they're filling up that spot. In the past, I've only done two. This year, I thought I would do three, and I think three is pushing it a little bit. So even though the math may work, sometimes you just got to do it and, and have more than the math says to find out whether it really is more or whether the math was accurate in the first place. And so uh, I, I went with three, knowing that two was better, and that just substantiated, for me at least, with those zucchini plants. Yeah, two zucchini plants in my four foot wide bed really makes more sense than trying to squeeze in three. Shandy's biggest lesson that everyone should learn is the extreme difference between agriculture and what we do call permaculture. Oh yeah. so. You know, too often what we think of um, gardening is based on agriculture. A lot of the row methods of gardening, the fertilizing, the pest control, the herbicides, most of that comes from agriculture. Big fields growing lots of plants. And that filters down and, and a lot of what is written and talked about for gardeners follows that same basic method of agriculture and i'd like to garden completely different than big agriculture and most of what i do is much closer to permaculture permaculture is permanent agriculture but it, it's designed for the home grower and you have your fruit trees and you have your fruit bushes and you have ground covers and you have all of your vegetable gardens and it all ties together using a lot of assistance from nature and understanding weather and how rain falls and where that rainwater flows. And so you design your beds and you design your garden areas with all of that in mind, where the rain is going to collect and you build your berms and your swales and collect the water and put the plants in the appropriate section. That's the basic concepts behind what permaculture is. So you're exactly right. Agriculture and traditional gardening is different than some of the other methods like permaculture and how we can choose to garden. And one of the things about permaculture, and this is on my list of things that you can actually teach in the garden, is philosophy. Much of how we garden comes down to what our philosophy is about gardening and what approaches we're going to take. Well, I, I end all of my episodes with a philosophy of some type or a question or something to think about because I think the garden is an ideal place to think about what your philosophies should be. As you start developing some of these philosophies, teach them to others. And why not actually teach historical philosophy in the garden? That's how it, it was done a couple thousand years ago when Plato and Socrates were discussing philosophy. They weren't doing it at a desk in a classroom. They were outside. Philosophy just flows through your being 
so much better when you could be outside discussing some of the philosophical elements that you want to discuss. And so permaculture is a philosophy, I think. Yes, there are methods to, to permaculture gardening, but I think it's all about choosing how you want to approach gardening as a mindset. What is your philosophy? What is your approach to gardening? And then just use that garden space to, to teach yourself. This is one of those lessons, you know, generally we think we have to have a teacher and a student to, to have a lesson in the garden. I think when it comes to philosophy, this is one of those things that you can do all by yourself. You can just be one with nature and develop your own philosophy as you teach yourself how you want to proceed in the garden. So I know this is very metaphysical and it, it kind of hard to, to quantify and write down a path to developing a philosophy, but think about it. Think about it as one of those lessons that can be taught and you can teach yourself. Hi, Bailey LM, a new member of the Gardener Scott channel. Thank you for joining the channel and make sure you take advantage of some of those perks that are listed when you signed up and I look forward to seeing your participation and, and welcoming you to the channel as you move forward with your garden journal or journey and try to figure out what some of your philosophies might be. Mr. Texas Bone, <coughs> I thought annuals was the way to go. After planting almond trees, I read a quote, you plant almond trees for your children, but you plant pistachio trees for your grandchildren. Interesting. And, and so, um, history is on my list. Let's talk a little bit about this as we talk about lessons to be learned. But, but this is a good way to, to think about time and how long it takes to establish the things that we want to be growing in my garden. And that's the kind of point for this, that, that almond trees take a long time to establish. I actually had some family members that owned an almond orchard in the past and pistachio trees are one of those things that historically pistachios in many regions of the world uh, have been a major part of agriculture. And some of those pistachio trees live much longer than humans. It takes a long time for them to get established. And so that, that's a, a good way that we can think about how we approach gardening is annuals are plants that we put in for just this year. Perennials are plants that we put in for the foreseeable future, and some of them can last a long time. I'm, I'm anticipating 20 years out of my asparagus beds. Trees, fruit trees, tend to be three to five years before we actually see fruit. Depending on the tree, nut trees take longer than that, which is why the almond trees and the pistachio trees are what you might think about for your children and your grandchildren. But this plays a part in, in how we approach gardening, looking at time as it moves forward. When we look at time as it has happened in the past, history is something that you can actually teach in the garden. You can teach about specific plants, like the history of the tomato. The tomato plant originated in Central and South America, and they were pea-sized fruit. And the Aztecs are thought to have really been the first to, to develop the tomato into a larger fruit and actually incorporate it into their diet. And so then when, the, when Cortez and the conquistadors came to Central America, they brought the tomato back to Spain. And so in Europe, the Spaniards were the first to start developing the tomato into part of their diet. And from Spain, it spread to Italy. And so there are so many dishes from both Spain and Italy that have tomatoes in them. A lot of the other regions in, in Europe Northern Europe, the tomato really didn't spread there too much. It finally found its way to England, and from England came back to the Americas. And so most of what we're growing in the United States came from English, 
English colonists of a few hundred years ago. But in the southern United States, much of what they're growing and their diets actually have that influence from Spain. And so you look at the tomato historically, and you can just, just see this circle of how it went from the Americas to Europe to back to the Americas. And it's, it's something that's been in our diet all along, but more prevalent in some societies as opposed to other societies. So great history lesson there. And you can do those same kind of history lessons with flowers, with tulips. We think of tulips coming from Holland, from the Netherlands, and, and the, the tulip craze of about 400 years ago. But tulips actually originated in areas thought to be near Afghanistan and maybe even Iraq and Iran. And so you think of the history of the tulip, how it started in a region of the world that we don't even associate it with. Then we think of it as associated with a part of Europe, and now it's growing in our own garden. Well, tracing the history of individual plants, I think, can be really fascinating, and it really can be a great way to not only look at particular plants, but how that movement of people, like from Europe to the Americas, and the plants that came with the, the, the people that settled, says a lot about those people and their cultures. Why not teach some of that? Why not bring history lessons into the garden and tie it to the garden? You can also look at some very famous, very important gardens in Europe. The gardens of Italy and France and the UK are just incredible. And they go back hundreds of years. You can tie the, the, the rise and fall of royalty, of dynasties. You can often tie that to some of these gardens that still exist in some of those countries. So I, I'm a big history buff. And when I can tie history to gardening, it just makes both subjects that much better to me. So teach history in the garden. Teach about the plants that were growing and where they came from. And for many of us, the plants we're growing did not come from where we're living. They had to come from someplace else. There's lessons there. And I, I love growing that or learning that kind of stuff. Okay, let's see. As we roll through, yeah, Bettina says the history of the spice trade. The world changed because of the spices that that the the Europeans in particular wanted, and then they just rolled around the world looking for those spices. So absolutely, the history of the spice trade and how it impacted the literally the face of the planet and, and the dynasties that rose and fell, countries that were conquered and developed, a lot of that goes down to spices, which is part of gardening and growing plants. It's, it's incredibly something. So, yeah, KGN says, um, there you go, Turkey. I knew it was that area in general. So Turkey, I think it's, you're right, that that is one of those areas where the tulips uh, originally came from. Um, but uh, also there is a, a lot of that. And, and, of course, Turkey is very close to Afghanistan. So Afghanistan really has played a role in a lot of plants that have moved around the world as well. Jerbian says, gardening teaches and reinforces some of the most important lessons in my life. Goal setting, planning, patience, perseverance, accomplishment, and most importantly, dealing with challenges and failures. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. That is definitely something we can all learn from gardening. Gardens happen. It's been hard to find, but medieval gardening subjects is a subject I'm interested in. You know, there's one of the things that is happening more and more and, and I've seen some videos on YouTube that as some of the medieval villages and, and castles are being renovated and discovered even, there, there are more and more efforts to figure that out, to figure out how they ate, how they gardened, and how they grew their plants. And so I, I agree with you. It's a subject I'm interested in too. And there's a lot more that's being discovered about a lot of that kind of fun stuff. So uh, definitely check it out and, 
And when you have that subject you're interested in, make it part of your individual curriculum and that subject is something you can become knowledgeable in. You might have to search a little bit like the medieval gardening, but there's information out there that you can definitely learn more about. Cass makes stuff. Max of Tasting History on YouTube has talked about various plants used in historical recipes. I haven't seen that channel. I'll have to check it out. Some of which are apparently extinct now or that nobody knows what the actual plant is. Interesting. So uh, yeah, there's there are there are some of those old recipes that that can't be recreated because we don't know what they're talking about because those plants have been lost. You know, and that's a whole nother area of gardening. I've talked about this in the past. I think it's been a few months ago. But the idea of gardening so that we don't lose that history, we don't lose those plants. And so to to grow heirlooms, to grow some of those plants that have a history of 100 or 200 or more years, if we can continue growing those plants and saving the seeds and continuing to, to, to keep that plant alive, I, I think that's an aspect of gardening that, that is beneficial for all of us. Because every year there are plants that are lost, that, that the last person growing that plant stops growing it, and some of those plants we don't even have know the name of anymore, but they're just lost. I'd, I've seen some uh, some papers, some um, articles about our own gardens and how the gardens of a hundred years ago were so much different than the gardens of today because they were growing different plants. A hundred years ago, the variety of plants that we were growing. The different, even within the same types, if you were growing tomato plants, the, the varieties that you were growing 100 years ago are completely different than the varieties we're growing today because of the seed companies and because of the marketing and because of the, the seed stands that are put up in all of the stores where we buy our seeds. We are all pretty much growing the same plants. We're growing the same type of beans, the same type of peppers, the same type of tomatoes. And when we do that, we're losing that, that breadth of variety. And so things are lost. Plants are lost. And, and I'm trying to do some of that even within my fruit trees. I'm growing apple trees like the Gravenstein apple. I'm trying to grow apples in my garden from trees and, and from varieties that have been around for a couple hundred years so that I can continue that basic philosophy, which is variety and history and keeping some of these plants going so that they're not lost. You know, if all of us grow sweet 100 cherry tomatoes and maybe a celebrity hybrid tomato, and those are the only ones we grow, look at all of the others that, have, that we aren't growing. And the more we focus in our garden on those things that we just always do the same, the more we lose out on opportunity to maybe expand the world and keep these varieties alive. So that's, that's a philosophy, and that's how I try to approach gardening, is growing as many heirlooms and those plants that have been around for a while as much as possible. And, and there are, around the world, different societies different organizations that try to promote that. So here in the United States, if you if you visit Monticello, for instance, Thomas Jefferson's home, where he had a garden 200 years ago, you can actually get some seeds from the plants that he was growing 200 years ago. Not necessarily the same plant, but the same type of plant that was being grow, grown 200 years ago. You can get some of those same seeds and grow those plants in your garden today. So <clears throat> how great is that to grow a plant and then be able to know and teach that it's the same plant that some other gardener was growing 200 years ago or even beyond. And I know in some places, some smaller villages in, in Europe in particular, 
they focus on that. And you might be able to, to get some of those seeds and continue that process in your own garden. <clears throat> Jay says, I have a Greenstein apple tree as part of in the building a small garden diversity. Good for you. Yeah, anytime we can get beyond, you know, my first apple tree that I grew was a red delicious apple tree because that's what you buy in the grocery stores, red delicious. So I thought, oh, I'll grow a red delicious apple tree. <clears throat> and nothing wrong with that. That's how I got started. I didn't know different at the time, but since then I've really expanded. So I don't know the Greenstein apple, but good for you. <clears throat> if it does well in your area and you want to grow it, do it. And, and that's a big part is finding out what will grow. Being selective enough so you choose varieties for all of us, because I know in my area I can't grow everything I would like to grow to keep this, this variety going just because of how harsh my winters are and how short my season is. So the plants I choose match what I can do in my garden, but I still try to have as big a variety as possible. <clears throat> Betty Barnes says, my dad had snow apple trees in the orchard. We were the only orchard that did in Southern Ontario. I don't know beyond that, that it's now pasture and the trees are lost, that's sad. Um, but you might be able to recreate that. Put in one of those apple trees, maybe you might be able to find it somewhere. <clears throat> I read recently there was, I forget where it was, it might have been Oregon. Um, there are different regions around the world, but like here in the United States, there are regions of Washington and Oregon where a lot of apple trees were grown and then abandoned. And some of them are being rediscovered. There are some small groups out there that are trying to, to rediscover some of these lost types of, in this case, apple trees. And there, I, there was one recently that was an apple tree that had been thought to have been gone forever. And it was rediscovered in one of these abandoned homesteads, um, I think in Oregon, I forget exactly. And so now it's being developed by a nursery to be sold to continue a, a plant that once was lost. How, how great is that if you have access to, to something along those lines? So Les Paul Slayer says many craft malter, maltsters are going back to the original barley stock and uh, they call them land races. Interesting. Yeah, the, barley is, is a crop that's been around for most of human history. And again, it's it's been modified, it's been changed, it's been focused. And so a lot of the barley that's being grown from or, or by distillers, for instance, it's all the same barley. Some of the distillers are getting their barley from the same pr suppliers. And so we've lost a lot of that diversity in, in things like barley. So uh, I think that's awesome that some of the, the craft brewers and craft distillers are, are going back to some of those, those historical grains. What a, what a great way to approach it. Uh, yeah, Brett Lee says the story of Johnny Appleseed is really cool and my type of philosophy. And so it, Johnny Appleseed is, uh, is a story that used to be taught in school. I don't think they teach it in school anymore. I learned it in school. Uh, but it's a story of a man that, that as the United States grew and as, as settlers moved west, he was right there growing apple trees. And so Johnny Appleseed has become part of Americana of someone who just plants an apple tree in the middle of nowhere. And there are, there are apples, apple trees that can be traced to Johnny Appleseed. But when you look into that story, it, it really is a fascinating story because there's more to it than that. In the United States, as, as settlers moved westward, Water, which is very important for all of us, water was not always safe to drink. And so beer and cider, hard cider, were actually a drink of choice to include for children because that alcohol would kill the microbes and, and the, the harmful uh, organisms that were in the water. You could drink 
the apple cider and the beer and know that you wouldn't get sick from it, where some of the water you would get sick from. And so part of what Johnny Appleseed's movement was, and he wasn't alone in this, was to move westward, plant an apple orchard, and that's where the town would develop because they would have apples there already as people moved in and they could make their hard cider, drink it, and they just keep kept doing that as they moved westward. So there's a lot more to the Johnny Appleseed story than just planting apple trees along the path, which is great in itself. There's uh, more about the, the movement of a population and the development of towns that actually play into that as well. So uh, again, so much history that can be taught in the garden that we can learn from. <coughs> That's funny. David says, my father said he went to bed drunk every night when he was working in India. Yeah, and exactly. A, a country that often has issues with the drinking water. And so the, the people drink the, the alcoholic beverages that are safer to drink. And I could see that going to bed drunk every night. That's funny. Bun for bun. Thank you for that super chat. Funnily enough, I picked from my Bramley apple tree the other day. Though I think I was too hasty, they looked ripe enough. Uh, yeah, wait a little bit, harvest, and hopefully you'll get some that are a little bit riper. But um, Bramley, that sounds like a, a, a great European, UK kind of apple tree. That's fantastic. So I like that idea. And thank you for that, that donation. I appreciate it. So they, you know, I've talked... I talk about some... Spe I try to avoid recommending specific varieties because... So many of you live in different areas than where I live, and what I can grow may not match with what you grow. But when I do mention specific varieties, I'm always interested in the comments I get. Like when I talk about Gravenstein apples, for instance, that's a variety that grows in the United States. It's not known in Europe. And so the comments I get from people, particularly in Europe, the comment on what they're growing, the specific varieties, to include tomatoes. I give my recommendations for the tomatoes I like to grow. A lot of those aren't varieties that, that are even available in other areas of the world. And so for yourself, find out what is a favorite, what is historical in your area, and absolutely continue to, to grow those, those type of plants. So. <coughs> The, uh, yeah, Francis, I agree, the Appleseed story is a pillar of America's Manifest Destiny tale. And, and absolutely, you know, Manifest Destiny in its own is, it, it's so many lessons to be learned from that, good and bad. And you're exactly right. The, the movement of people westward and the, the planting and the whole Manifest Destiny idea within United States history, uh, there's days and days of lessons to be taught there. So absolutely look into that as potential lessons that, uh, and, it, and it's not all good. Some of it we need to learn because of harm that was done in the history of the world and, and the plants and the spices and all the rest definitely play a part in that. So before I forget, while I'm thinking about it, let's talk about the background today. Uh, so this comes from Celeste also known as Masabi Gal, and wanted to, to share her garden. There's a lot going on here. A lot is, is, is what you might recognize within your own garden or what I've pointed out in, in some of these backgrounds before. And so you've got the cattle panel or the hog panel hoops. And so there's one here, there's one here, there's one in the far background. You also see the same type of low hoops. This is what I use in my garden. There's a green stock growing outside on the patio filled with plants. Of course, you've got lots of raised beds. This is something new we haven't done a lot of talking about. This is a, a keyhole garden bed. The idea being that you've got this cutout in the middle. This is the keyhole. So you have a bed that wraps all the way around and then you walk into the middle to access this garden bed. So a nice keyhole garden bed with some pavers to be able to 
walk in between. Of course, the sitting space back here, the chair and table, and uh, might even be a coffee cup there, a little bit of shade in the afternoon so that you can sit in the garden and enjoy your garden space. I like garden art. So this owl that's sitting in the garden, look at the lights. These look like the solar lights. We've had some pictures about that in the in recent weeks as well. So the lights will soak up and then also around other spots in the garden to light the garden at night so you can still enjoy that space after the sun goes down. I love that idea. This is really cool. I like this idea. The 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 wheel, the bicycle wheel that's just hanging as a a little piece of garden art in the garden. I love that idea. And then, of course, the bird bath, all of the other plants. Notice that these hoops are not uh, for walking through, that this is a tall trellis in this garden bed. And the same behind, the, the bed actually anchors the archway. Now, this one is in that keyhole, but a uh, great way to grow plants up a a tall hoop like that is to anchor the hoop in the garden bed you may recognize this mailbox I, I i did a video about the mailbox in the garden great place to store your garden tools so a lot of what's happening in celeste garden is what's happening in my garden and you may be able to recognize it as well this looks like a a little set of wind chimes that's hanging so there's a lot happening back here here's another green stock and so I, I i love i love this garden there's just so many different things happening in this garden and that's how i like to garden is to always have different things going on different types of beds different ways of growing and so thank you so much for sharing this picture with me you look back here on the deck you can see the hummingbird feeders as well and and so with the trees I imagine there are a lot of birds more than just the hummingbirds that like to enjoy this garden space so uh, take some ideas from this and maybe try something new in your garden I, I, I like the, the bicycle idea that's those are the kind of things that as I continue building my garden you'll see me doing some some what some might consider odd I consider unique and it definitely makes your garden space your garden space because you can design it however you want to garden. And I think that's what it's all about. Um, while, while we're looking at these green stocks, I do want to mention there is a huge green stock sale coming very soon. Now, I don't know and I can't share all the specifics, but it's happening very soon. And I'll definitely send notifications out on my community page, on the Gardner Scott page. I'll, I'll notify on Facebook. I'll also send it out on Twitter. But there's a big sale. This might be the biggest sale of the year. So if you're thinking about doing a green stock, I would say hold off for just a little bit and look for that notification because uh, it, it's an incredible sale that's coming up and, and it's happening very soon. So a little bit of a teaser. When I get the specific information that I can share, I'll definitely share it with you. Because as you can see, Celeste has two green stocks uh, as part of the garden setup, and I've got three. And I did the video this weekend where I was talking about trans, um, transferring from the the summer garden to the fall garden in the green stock, and so this transition time is happening right now. And I've got my fall garden started in my green stock. And some of the comments from people that have four or five, six, eight green stocks, I, <laughs> it's definitely an option for growing. So if you're one of those people who have four, now you want five, look for this sale coming up because I think it's going to be pretty cool. And I put a link in the description below for green stock when that time comes. And then when I send out the notification, I'll definitely send a link to it. Because the nice thing is, especially with a sale like this, if you if you use the Gardner Scott code, you can get $10 off. So now you, you buy it on sale and you get $10 off. Uh, definitely a bargain. Definitely something to look at. So Simplified Gardening. Tony's here with us today. Love sales. You know, this is one of those things that, that um, I've got on my list. I'll be talking in the live stream in 
might be next week next week or the week after that is is to take advantage of sales so i'll be talking about some of the things you can do at the end of season and now is actually a good time to start thinking about that i think i've got it scheduled for next week's live stream i'll be talking about some of these things so just uh a, a brief point to talk about as Tony loves sales, all of us love sales, I think, particularly when it comes to plants and garden merchandise. And so start looking at your garden centers and at your nurseries because end of summer, end of growing season can be a really good time to get some bargains. And so I do a lot of the plant buying. Most of what I grow in my landscape i start from seed or i propagate from the plants i have but the plants i do buy i tend to buy in late summer and early fall when they go on clearance and i think it's a great opportunity so we'll talk more about that in the weeks ahead but absolutely definitely look into uh, what you can do to save money and get it on sale with every opportunity Shandy's Garden says, my theme is Neapolitan all around my house with brown and cream and pink. Awesome. That's definitely something you can tie in with the garden. The colorist says, hello, Gardener Scott. Have a white-backed spider laying eggs. It bothers the raspberry canes. Any ideas? So I doubt that it's bothering the canes. What it's probably doing is eating some of those pests that would be bothering your canes. And so... Often we see a problem on one of our plants and then we see an insect or an arachnid and think that that's the cause of the problem. It could be that you have another insect that's, that's feeding on the leaves, that might actually be eating the fruit. And what has happened is that the spider has moved in to eat those pests. And so uh, spiders don't eat plants. And so I, I, I can almost assuredly say that it's not the white-backed spider that's bothering the raspberry canes. The question is, can you live with spiders in your garden? I hope you can, because I love spiders in my garden. The spiders are eating those pests that are eating your plants. And so my idea is to leave the spider alone. If, if I see spiders in my garden, I leave them alone until I can't. I mean, if I have to move a plant or harvest a plant, I will. But, but I love seeing the spiders. Identifying the spider is an important aspect. And so try to find out just exactly what kind of spider you have because that's a whole other part of biology that we can learn in our garden is the specific animals and the specific insects in our garden and then learning if they're beneficial or not and most spiders that we can see in our garden almost all of them are beneficial the harmful spiders like the black widows uh, in particular uh, you're not going to see them spinning a web right in the middle of your garden they like dark hidden spots so that's where they're going to be and the brown recluse which was a spider that i had all around us in oklahoma everywhere in the house we had brown recluse spiders in the closets in the corners underneath the house but never in the garden they're not building a web outside so the the spiders that can actually bite us and cause harm aren't going to be in your garden and the spiders that you see in your garden are usually an ally and so that's that's what I would suggest as far as the spiders that are on your raspberry canes is try to learn more about them and then work with them and find out what it is they're eating and and that's another thing I've actually learned about some pests in my garden by identifying the predator when I see that predator show up I find out who what that predator is and what it's doing find out what kind of insect it's eating and sometimes that's a way to find out that you have a garden pest that you didn't even know you had. Your leaves are being eaten and you didn't know what was eating it. Well, if you can identify the predator, that might help you identify that particular insect that was eating your plants. So another great way to figure out and learn all about that, that nature food web, both below ground but above ground as well. 
Orifle says, I like spiders until they live in my shoe or become too big. Yeah, that was the problem with the brown recluses. Uh, and we also had uh, lots of other issues like scorpions that would be in the shoe. So uh, often a problem, but it, it could be one of those things to watch out for. And actually, Nighthawk, Nighthawk does raise a good point. Uh, I talked about this a few weeks ago with someone who had thought they had spiders and it was more likely spider mites. So do be aware of the differences. A spider mite is completely different than a spider. So everything I just said about spiders is, is how I approach spiders. But if you identify it, again, that's the key point in identifying any pest that you think is causing harm. If it's a spider mite, then that's completely different. And dealing with the spider mites, often you can just hose them off. You can uh, put neem oil and horticultural soap to deal with the, the spider mites, uh, but definitely identify it first. And so, yes, you ask a good question. It might not be a spider at all. It might be a spider mite, and that's a whole different approach and that is something spider mites in general you can often keep under control they don't cause a big problem but in large numbers they can actually uh, harm some of the plants and that's what we want to deal with as much as possible uh, so DJ is asking about <coughs> solutions for locusts taking over the garden and birds are about the only thing you can do there's very little you can do with locusts you can try to treat your plants with a systemic pesticide and the locusts will eat the leaves and then it can uh, kill the locusts over a period of time. That also works on other insects like caterpillars that are eating your your leaves. You can you can treat your plants so that when they ingest that leaf, that leaf uh, that that it can kill the plant doesn't work real well with locusts in particular but birds attracting birds to your garden birds in large enough numbers that they'll eat the grasshoppers and particularly during the nesting time you're going to have the most success and so that's what i do with grasshoppers is i just attract the birds to my garden and periodically i see the birds eating the the grasshoppers cats are great too cats are wonderful grasshopper or locust killers and so bring the cats to the garden. Mala actually likes to chase the grasshoppers. She, she does a pretty good job of catching them and uh, a lot of the other flying insects in the garden. So uh, animals are usually the, the solution when it comes to, to those kind of things. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, Bohemian Herbology says, I hear tons of locusts have no damage, must be the birds. And, and so, um, it's one of those things identifying just what the, the problem is, at, at whether the plants are being eaten, the fruit is being eaten, and that'll help figure out what the exact pest is and what the solution might be. James Pulaski, thank you as a new, or Janice Pulaski, thank you for joining us as a member of the Gardener's Got channel. Look forward to seeing you as well if you join our Facebook group. And we'll be doing uh, some other perks for members coming up in the days ahead. So nice to see you here with that as well. Uh, okay, let's see. Sandy's Garden says, I would have went to the nearest car wash and vacuumed out my tar. I'm guessing there's a side conversation based on you and what Cass is saying about um, what's happening inside your car. So I'll have to catch up on that and see what it was I missed. Warm fuzzy vibes, put a solar fountain in the front area and birds are very attracted and the mockingbirds eat all kinds of bugs, including grasshoppers. There you go. That's, and that's a big reason why I've got water features in my garden as well to attract the birds. So I've got bird houses and water features and brush piles and the, the, some of the plants. I actually allow them to eat the, the fruits. I keep my, my plants that seed into the winter for those birds that eat the seed and so lots of ways you can attract the, the birds to the garden so i think that's a great idea okay um one last thing here with alan brown recluse spiders do not spin webs they are ambush killers yeah that's why you find them in your your shoes 
And, you know, like I said earlier, the webs you find in your garden are not going to be those kind of spiders because they're going to be in those dark areas and you're not going to find them in your garden. So don't be too worried about them in your garden. So, okay, let's see. It looks like someone was asking a question about the green stock. Um, I've got a few video videos about green stock, but it's what you see back here with this stack. Each of these is a tier and each of these tiers has little individual cells and you can plant in each of those cells its stacks. The thing that makes the green stock different from a lot of the other vertical gardens that you'll see, there are vertical gardens on the market that look similar and you water them from above and the water flows all the way down to each of the levels, which means that top level is gonna be the wettest and the bottom level is gonna be the driest. But in the green stock, each of these levels has its own watering reservoir. And so when you water from the top, it runs down the center to the reservoir, which then runs down the center to the next reservoir, which then runs down to the next reservoir. And so it's a much more even watering method than a lot of the other vertical systems. And so the video that I just did uh, on Saturday actually shows those little reservoirs in each of the tiers. And uh, that's one reason why some of us like the green stocks because they're 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 easier to water each level than some of the other systems out there. So uh, absolutely something to consider if it's something you haven't done before. Uh, I, I've got two of them right outside my back door and I like to grow salad crops, but this year I actually start growing peppers. So I've got my shishito peppers in my green stock this year. And so just a few days ago, we had shishito peppers with dinner and I just walked out the back door, harvested right there on the pepper plants in my green stock, came in, sauteed up a couple of those, uh, those shishito peppers, enjoyed them. What's easier than that? I, I love shishito peppers. I know a lot of you do too. So, so I wanted to share with you today uh, as, as we talk philosophies and how we approach gardening and just what gardening can do from you or for you. And so had a really nice message from Matt this last week. And so Matt had started gardening as a result of the, of the pandemic, like many of you may have done. So about three years ago, had some teenage kids that were interested in growing their own food and having their own garden. So Matt was right on top of it, started the garden, wasn't an experienced gardener, started watching YouTube, of course, discovered the Gardener Scott videos and started learning gardening and experimenting with gardening and doing the gardening. And like many of us who started gardening with teenagers, the teenagers quickly leave the picture because they got lots of other things that they need to do. That's what happened to me and my kids. And so Matt was gardening in that first year, anticipating that he was going to be gardening with his teenage kids, ended up being he was the one that was doing the bulk of the gardening, but fell in love with it. And in that first year, knew that he was going to be a lifelong gardener. So right there, just that message alone, I think is enough to share with others because that's what happens to so many of us. But so eloquently, Matt shared with me that in his second year of gardening, he just loved it. Just started experimenting more and more. And it was the, the enthusiasm, as he stated it, of wanting to garden and doing more and more with the garden that really helped solidify gardening for him as just that enjoyable endeavor. And then the third year, this is the third year that he's in now, that's when it really set hold. And he now identifies for himself gardening as a passion, maybe even an obsession. So three years from starting, to an obsession, or at least a passion, I think that's awesome. And, th and that's actually a pretty, pretty fast progression. For me, it was a little bit slower than that. I started gardening about 30 years ago while I was still working and 
tried to get the teenagers involved, started way too big. So it was more work and effort and I wasn't able to enjoy it as much. But then as I learned more and more and was able to enjoy it, I would say that that enthusiasm that Matt had in the second year, for me, that came at maybe year five. And then that enthusiasm is what really got me interested in gardening. But, but I was still working and the kids and everything else. And the passion was developing. And I would say for me, it was at about the 10 year point that it really became an obsession that I really just needed to garden and try new things and build new beds and grow different plants. And, and so hats off to you, Matt, to have learned so quickly on your garden journey. And, and now you're moving into the years ahead already with that passion of gardening. And so what I wanted to share with you today is that, that, that concept and how we approach gardening. It might have just taken hold of you. And like Matt, you knew in just a couple years that this really was something you were going to do for the rest of your life. For some of the rest of us, it was a little bit slower in developing, but we still reached that point where we're a gardener and we want to garden and we want to garden for the foreseeable future for as much time as we have left to be able to garden. And that's how I look at it. Every year now, I'm enthusiastic about starting the garden and I'm passionate. And yes, I do reach that obsession level in certain plants and at certain times of year. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's something to look forward to. So if you're new to gardening and still in that growth period and you hear all of us talking about how wonderful gardening is and it hasn't hit you that way yet, don't worry too much about it. Don't think that you're missing out or that you're doing something wrong. It just takes longer in different people. Three years for Matt, 10 years for me, but we're now both at that same point on our gardening journey when it comes to what we want to do, what we want to do this year and next year and every year. And of course, every year is different, but the underlying motivation is the same for all of us that reach that point of gardening being something that's just part of us, just part of our lives. It's who we are. It's what we have to do. And so relish that. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy each step. And maybe try to identify where you are on that journey. Have you gardened for a year or two or three and you see that enthusiasm starting to grow, you're on the path. And then where are you on your journey within those same three years or maybe at the five or six or seven year point where you're finding that you have a moment, you have some time in the day and you don't know what you're gonna do. And then suddenly you find yourself in the garden. That's the point when you start recognizing that it's becoming a passion. It is something that that is part of your day. You need to be in the garden. And then, like some of us, when you wake up in the morning and some of your first thoughts are, what am I going to do in the garden today? Yeah, it's moved past that passion point. And, and I don't see obsession as a bad word. I don't see it as something that needs to be cured. I see it as just an identification that, yeah, I need to be in the garden. It's just a question of how early I get in the garden and which activities I do first. But I think there's a lot of us that wake up starting our day as a gardening day. And everything else is just kind of built around when we find time to be out in the garden. So uh, think about that for yourself and where you are on that journey. And uh, Matt says he doesn't get to join the live streams, but often watches and replay. So thank you, Matt, for sharing your story with me so eloquently stated on in just a few paragraphs of where you are in your garden journey and just how important it has become to you in three years. And so for the rest of you, if you haven't already shared it in the comments, let us know some of your thoughts. Where are you in that journey? One year, 20 years? or more 
and what level do you consider yourself enthusiastic or passionate or just interested and looking forward to maybe creating some of those those deeper emotions that the garden can bring out in you so the garden is just such a fascinating place and i just love talking about it so much as you well know yankee sister says a warm welcome and a warm welcome back to you we'll also be preparing three green stalks for fall good take care and blessings yeah and so green stock and and i'm like i love the green stock and and it's not a perfect system for everybody everywhere i've been answering a lot of questions lately about strawberries and what i find or have found that for zone seven and above the green stock is ideal for growing strawberries i tried to grow strawberries this last winter in my zone five garden and they did well but they didn't survive the winter and i had some very cold temperatures in the winter it was just too harsh for me to grow the strawberries in a container i've tried growing strawberries in containers before doesn't matter the container just doesn't work in my area zone six will probably work particularly if you add some protection maybe not so you can't grow every plant that you're growing in your garden in a green stock depending on your climate in particular but you can try and this year like i said my shishito peppers are doing great in my green stock that's something new for me you might want to try it if you can it's the lower 48 right now that they're they're shipping to and so there are limitations that not all of us can be growing in a green stock so keep gardening the way you're you're gardening but uh, I'm glad that Yankee sister, you've got three of them and that you're enjoying them. And, and I know there's a lot of people that have even more than that. So um, let's see, I'm gonna scroll down and see if there was something that I might've missed as we roll to the end of our time. Jihad says, my second year with my balconies container garden. And I consider the best time I spend during my day is the time with the plants that's awesome so there you go two years and still already recognizing the best time is the time in the garden and and you raise a good point and i know we've i know we've talked about this before that uh and actually the picture the background i'm planning i'm putting in for next week is a balcony garden it doesn't have to be a big space like this for you to get all the benefits of gardening it can be just a balcony garden and so take full advantage of whatever space you have, whatever method you're growing in, and just soak up all of the knowledge that you can from others, but more importantly, with the theme of today, what you can teach to others in the garden, even if it isn't a gardening subject. There's just so many other things that we can learn in the garden. So uh, hope hope you enjoy today on that gardening journey i hope this next week is great for you for those of us that are at the peak of our harvest and and approaching even more harvests of plants that are just now starting to come in and i look forward to seeing you here next monday as we just continue this fascinating and energizing journey to become more enthusiastic and more passionate and all of you definitely help me on that journey and help me achieve that as well so Thanks for spending the time today, and we'll see you here next week. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.